Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Marcella Central School District Board of Education meeting for this evening, Monday, March 14th, 2022. At this time, I would ask that you please stand and join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the agenda this evening, recognition. Well, we are very excited to have the McLaughlin family here with us tonight um, to do some special recognition of a very special young lady, Katie. And I am going to turn you over to her coach, Lauren Foster. Either way. <laughs> Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to speak to you tonight on behalf of the girls basketball program here at Marcellus. Um, it was not long ago that I had the honor of becoming the varsity basketball coach with a program um, that needed a little TLC. There was a strong group of young athletes coming through the driver middle school um, doors that showed promise to be something truly special on and off of the basketball court. Katie McLaughlin was one of those student athletes. As an eighth grader, Katie started the basketball season as the leader of the JV team and ended the season as a contributing member of the varsity squad, and she's never looked back. As a freshman, her offensive contribute, uh, contribute, contribution, contribution, excuse me, in quick hands on defense earned her recognition from other coaches in the league. All league honors are voted by all other coaches in the league. We are not allowed to vote for our own players. As a freshman, Katie was named to the second team all league team. Her sophomore year, she led her teammates to winning the first league championship in 20 years here at Marcellus and also earned first team all league honors. Last year, her junior year, we were blessed with at least half of a season due to COVID playing only 11 games with no postseason play. Yet Katie was still able to help lead the team to an undefeated season, earning the status of league champions once again. This year, Katie's senior year, we definitely had unfinished business and goals to attain. Her hard work and dedication every day, pushing not only herself, but her teammates to play their best did not go unnoticed. For the third year in a row, the team earned league champion status, and Katie was again named to the first team All-League, also named to sectional tournament All-Star team for her stellar performances, and her team has also named her their most valuable player. That is not all. With her team by her side, on January 27, senior night versus APW, in the second quarter, in front of the visiting spectators on the left-hand side of the court, Katie switched a three-point shot that marked history in the Marcellus basketball program. Katie scored her 1,000th point, a feat that is extremely difficult to attain in truly three and a half years of a varsity basketball career. Katie is known, is one of three known female basketball players to achieve this prestigious award and we could not be any more proud of every 1,174 career points that you have scored. Congratulations. You guys will not often look at a photo. Yes, you must not be in a photo. Oh, come on, yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Congratulations, Katie. Um, I would just like to say that as a, a resident, a parent myself, and a, and a board member, I'm going to be sorry to see you leave. 
uh, but is the principal of a school that you uh, toasted for 29 points this year, <laughs> I'm not gonna be sorry to see you leave. So <laughs> congratulations. And um, you certainly brought a lot of, uh, a lot of class and dignity, um, not only points, but class and dignity to the court as well. Thank you. Congratulations, Katie and, and mom and dad too. It was a, a lot of fun to watch this year. And you, we, even with a little confetti, we even had confetti on them. <laughs> Compliments of Kelly Ward. We have to give a shout out to Kelly. She had a lot of energy that night for, for Katie. So we appreciate you taking a few minutes to come tonight so that we could recognize Katie. And thank you, Warren, as well. Yeah. I also just wanted to take a minute and uh, recognize the cast, crew, and directors of the All School Show. I, um, I think the board knows I escaped last week just to get away for a few days. It's been a long time since I've gotten out of town, and my one devastation was missing the All School Show. And I joked um, with with one of the parent volunteers, you know, well maybe weather will be bad and they'll have to postpone one of the performances until Sunday because I'll be back. And lo and behold, I put my spell on Central New York and I was able to go see the show on Sunday and it was truly spectacular. So really an excellent job. And anyone who's had children, I know Mike has, um, and Janine too, I think you've had children in the all school shows. It is, it is so much work and so many hours and what, what an exciting thing for, for the kids in the, in the community to celebrate. It was a great performance. It really was exceptional. Item number four, presentations, <clears throat> project-based learning, coding in the classroom. So um, we had picked for our area of focus to talk a little bit about project-based learning. And I wanted to, the administrative team made a, a list of some of the areas that we felt like to highlight. We had originally intended to start with uh, Tyler Cooper's students doing independent study. They're, they're really delving into some pretty deep projects that are very individualized to them and that the students felt like they weren't quite far enough along to feel like they could do it justice. And so I knew who my number two was, and that was Katrina Ercole, who is one of our technology integration specialists. And Katrina has been working on um, maybe not anything that I would define in the purest form as project-based learning, but an important precursor. You remember when I passed you the definition of PDL, there's a lot of components to a PDL, and it's not something that you can flip a switch um, in a traditional school and get kids accustomed to functioning in such a, a different way. So you really have to start planting seeds and doing some different types of experiential learning along the way to prepare them for, for more in-depth PDLs. So Katrina has been doing some exciting things this year, and I think she has at least one, if not two, she has one guest, two guests here with her tonight um, that will be talking um, with her a little bit about what the experience has meant to them. So I'm gonna get your slides up here and you can take it away. Okay, good evening. Um, as Michelle said, I'm Katrina Arpol and I'm technology integration here in Marcellus. K through 12. And, and we've been working with these particular kits since um, end of November. So um, these Lego kits that we purchased, um, uh, the students use their iPad or their Chromebook, and there are five different units that they can work through. So what we've done is um, I use one unit per grade level. So first through fifth grade uh, is um, are using these these kits. Within each unit, there are five to six activities. So the students never repeat what they're doing. Each time I come into the classroom, they're doing a new activity. When they move from third grade to fourth grade, they'll move into a new unit. So there's no repetition really as they continue to do this. And uh, they have the experience of working with us about once a month. So by the time we get through all of the classrooms, it's time to come back around to another class. There's a lot of scaffolding, so you can see the lower image here on the screen is what the younger students are using for coding is 
the blocks and just images. And then up above is a more involved coding, which we call word blocks, where they have a lot more variables and things that they can add to their programming. They follow guided building instructions with the Legos and then guided coding instructions. But once they're finished with that particular build, they have the opportunity to then continue with their own creativity. So they might add physically to what they built, more bricks, more motors, more lights, uh, something like that. They also have the opportunity to build on their own coding. So they might decide to add sounds to it. They might add a light and when the light goes on and off or uh, just a lot of, once they finish just the, the directed self, uh, self-guided um, piece of the activity, they can then kind of do their own creativity thing. So I uh, love the fact that Yes, they're following directions and yes, they're learning to code, but it also has a lot of uh, creativity and independence in there as well. So um, I originally heard about these kits, but they were, it was a kit for older students. So did a little digging and found this younger kits, um, which are really like K through, they advertise them, they have to be below K. So we felt that first or fifth grade would be a good age group to target to enhance some STEAM skills for them. And um, I approached Mac to see if they would purchase these for us and they graciously purchased 10 kits for us. So if we think about uh, an average number of students in a class is about 10 kids, when uh, 20 kids, when we use the kits, there's really just two, maybe three kids using a kit. So it really maximizes the hands-on experience that they have. Uh, they spent a lot of time uh, following directions, uh, working together, a couple of pictures here with the kids. So, so the coding was important to me, the following directions, learning how to do this. But the most powerful thing that has come out of it for me is to watch the collaboration, the cooperation, the problem solving, um, the creativity, the sharing. Those social skills are just I literally have been blown away to watch how these kids work with each other. I did like a quick math of, okay, we've, I've been into rooms probably 80 times so far and 20 kids per room. You're talking 1600 experiences. I have yet to have one student say to me, I give up. I can't do this. This isn't any, it, it's just, I, I'm truly amazed at their perseverance and their willingness to just keep trying and figure things out. Most of the time when they come to me and say, I can't do, or I, I can't figure this out, can you help me? I redirect them and they typically can figure it out on their own. Uh, at the end of a session, I usually just say to them, who, had a, who ran into a problem? Who solved the problem? And who gave up? No one. So it's been, it's been quite an experience. A couple, uh, a couple quick videos here. Um, this, this example is where something didn't work and they had to reprogram and make it work. So they're supposed to get it to stop right in front of the light. So on their first attempt, uh, it went way too far. So they had to reprogram and figure out the correct speed to get it to stop. And these are just a couple other images of some things that kids build, uh, kind of show you the types of things that they might have an opportunity to work with. Vehicles, you can see we've got motors and lights students using the app on their Chromebook. So it's really, um, I've been so pleased to see the reaction of the students and their, um, their ability to just keep trying and, and work at it. I have two students here with me, if Aria and Rylan could come on up and just talk a little bit about uh, their experience with using the kits. Here we go. So if you guys want to just come on over here. So Aria, can you just uh, kind of share with people what it's been like to use the kits and what experience you've had? Um, I really like using the kits and they're like not only fun, like they can help you problem solve. Like one app, like sometimes the hot and stuff like the show didn't hit the ball. So I have to like make it longer and have it hit the ball. And like if you also have a problem solve ball, you're in the corner, you couldn't 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. how about your experience? Um, I really like it um, also, and you, it, you have to persevere if something doesn't work, and it, and you have to just keep trying until, until you can figure it out, and it, and then at the end, it's just fun to add on more, to more things and just have fun with it. Yeah. Anybody have any questions for them or for me? Does this make you guys kind of guys interested in science? Do you see yourself wanting to do more with this like next year and get older? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Break some school a little bit, have some fun with your hands, build some things, program. Pretty cool. Good job. <laughs> So if, if you recall um, back to when we were talking about some of the foundations of PBL and, and what you're trying to achieve in a project-based learning application, you know, it's something that's authentic. Obviously, coding is very authentic um, learning. You may not be a, a coding a little machine to run across the ground, but um, coding can be used in so many, so many ways. You know, it's a great skill to have. But in addition, um, the soft skills that Katrina talked about are really the things that uh, a PBL can also bring about. You know, how do you collaborate, work in teams? And we know that so many companies and industries now just rely heavily on the ability to do that. And I think as adults, probably one of our largest fears throughout this time of COVID was that we would be taking a step in the wrong direction when it comes to those types of things because kids were more isolated they're staring you know at a screen they're not in a room you know communicating so we feel really blessed not only that we've been able to be in person here at school so much but also to have this really unique opportunity and and katrina's passion and fire to bring this to the kids so I think all, it's a all, great. all the kids getting this opportunity k through whatever First through fifth grade. grade. What is it? First through fifth grade. And everybody's already done this, or you? Oh like yeah, like we, I'm on in some classes. I'm on their third time, and others uh, more. So you go in the classroom. And I take it into the classroom and facilitate the, the time with the kids. Yeah. So what happens six, seven, eight now? Well, I'm thinking about going to math again because there is an older kid that's yeah. more involved and more intricate and a little bit higher level thinking, but I've been talking with um, a science teacher who was asking about robotics and coding. And I said, let's see if maybe math maybe next year, um, because I would hate to see, we do this to fifth grade and then what do we do next? Right. So right. my pitch to Mac is gonna be, let's continue this for six, seven. Got to be. How long are you in the classroom for each classroom? Um, about 45 minutes to an hour. And you think you hit each classroom at least three times during the year? Oh, more than that. Really? Once a month. Once oh, a month. Once a month. Yep. Yeah, she's been in three times so far. Oh, okay. And then, yeah, okay. every every class from first through fifth grade, I've been in at least three times, if not more. So. Thought you said you had kids that started for kindergarten, so they don't. Get this is this is geared towards kindergarten, but when I talk with the, it says it's K through or even younger. Talk with the kindergarten teachers, and they. There's a lot of little parts. Yeah, yeah. So right. first grade <laughs> yeah. feels like they're not gonna eat. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's just it's the inventory of the parts. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm kind of like, like the nose and the ear. It's like okay, let's find make sure there are no parts in the room. And every so often, a teacher will come and say, "I found this in the room." Okay, you're a kid. It goes yeah. now. <laughs> but, so um, you're right. I mean, the two kids, right? They spoke a lot about the. The coding and but two terms I heard persevere and problem solve right and those skills will be with those kids forever and it's amazing what I see I'm just like I said blown away yeah. that they don't give up yeah and I don't usually give them the answer to their question I like, turn it back around tell them this trick picture again what do you think is going wrong see if you can figure it out so my freshman in college is an engineering major. And so he had this lab and last week he said to me, so when he was in about sixth grade, he um, asked for Christmas for this coding for dummies, right? So he kind of played around with that when he was in sixth grade and really kind of enjoyed it. So he was doing this engineering um, design class and it was all about this like 
coding and it was at the foundational level. So he said he was in this small group because because they were looking at him like he was a genius. He goes, little do they know that by lesson two, I'm tapped out. <laughs> so it'll be great when these kids have all these years of experience getting up there and, you know, it's going to inspire them and give them so much more depth. So that's great. Yeah, I hope we can continue beyond fifth grade. Sure. Do you have plans for that? Do you have staff for that? Yeah. There, no, there's no plans to retire. There's, <laughs> uh, we do have, I mean, it's extracurricular at this point, but remember, we do have a robotics program at the middle level. It's been a while since um, we've heard updates on that, but we do have a functioning robotics program at the middle level and at the high school level. And we also do have you know, some classroom situations that are a little bit easier to embed. You know, we have some science teachers who would be hungry to take kids and use them in the room. And of course, what we're trying to do is build our students' tolerance for not just the sit and get, just tell me what you need me to do and tell me when I have the right answer, because that becomes ingrained in kids very quickly. And it's definitely a theme here. You know, we find that our older students are sort of less tolerant for these creative methods because they feel like they're not being taught. And it, it's really because it, it, you need to develop some of that grit and exploration and resilience to problem solve. And that's something that you can't flip a switch on. You know, when you've been teaching a certain way for many years, you have to sort of enter into it. So that's sort of what this has been for us is a, an inroad to sort of changing up the approach and building a tolerance for something that isn't as sit and get based. I love that we have those extracurricular opportunities at the higher levels, but I love that you're building this in within the curriculum time, because even though those electives are opportunities for kids, they're pulled in so many different directions, they may not get that even though it's offered. So I, I would love to see it continue within the curriculum, you know, on a higher level. That's great. I think it's only a matter of time before we see coding and robotics as course offerings. Mm -hmm. It is now. We have that robotics in the high school. Yeah. yeah. And I, to Janine's point, 100%, you, you know, part of our exploration with you as a board and talking through some of these things is to highlight the seeds that are being sown so that we can figure out where we need to channel resources. You know, while I greatly appreciate Mac, there's a point at which, you know, we put a stake in the ground and say, hey, this is this is the direction we want to take and we want to flow some of our resources towards that. Mm -hmm. right. So that's sort of what this is about, is exploring what's happening and where we go from here. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Katrina. Speaking of resources, budget update. <laughs> So um, I sent out a message today, just letting everyone know that it would be our hope that we would be able to adopt uh, our budget at the next meeting. That'll help us with the timeline a little bit, getting uh, items out to our community. We've had some, there's been some slowdowns with getting mail uh, out to the, all of the reaches of our community. It seems like no matter how much in advance we're getting things out. So. We are trying to get a jump, although this budget is a little bit um, lackluster just in terms of usually there's a little more drama with the budget. There's some things happening, but I think uh, with the COVID federal money, it's really settled things down quite a bit, at least for a couple of years, which is nice because we've had drama in lots of other areas. So Tony is going to run through the propositions that you're um, considering you know, for placement on the ballot later on in the agenda, and then hit a couple of other highlights for you, uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Michelle. So uh, on your agenda tonight, we will be adopting a resolution that uh, puts forth the propositions that will appear on the ballot. This is something that boards need to do at about this time each year, because we do have some legal notices that have to be published. I think we have to, the first has, has to be run by April 2nd or 3rd this year. So, uh, so it's always about this time that you're putting, uh, uh, putting forth a, a resolution for you to adopt the proposition. So the proposition one is the budget. Uh, proposition two are uh, school buses. So each year, our transportation supervisor looks at her 10-year replacement plan, identifies the buses that will be uh, coming off uh, out of our uh, assets uh, list. 
and uh, then of course those buses need to be replaced. So we're looking to replace uh, two 66 passenger buses and one 30 passenger bus with real triplet. Just a reminder that the state does provide approximately 75% reimbursement for purchase of school buses. And uh, as we say here, that if uh, voters do approve the purchase of buses, then we'll, we'll proceed with disposal of those three. If for some reason the voters don't approve, we hang on to those three and we continue to maintain them. That's, uh, that's that simple. Proposition three. A quick question. question. When you say disposal, are we able to get anything for them, for the buses that we replace? Yeah, that's a great question. So we either we put the buses up to for auction or uh, when we buy new buses, we get a trade in. And so we measure, you know, where, where is the best bank for a buck, whether it's auction or trade in, and that's uh, how, how we proceed. So we don't just put them out the pasture. Uh, no, no. Although you may, you may see buses and parked in people's yards. Uh, those are folks who have bought buses by auction. So uh, turning them into campers. Yeah, but we don't give them away. To the future. Uh, the, the proposition three this year is an increase for the Marcellus Free Library. Uh, so as, uh, as it states here, Education Law 259 authorizes a lot of libraries to request additional funding. Uh, we do collect the um, a levy for the library, and we also will include them in, in any uh, propositions we put forth in May. Uh, they, they have not asked for an increase in two years. This is a, it's, since I've been here each year, they have asked for a 2% increase. Uh, they stopped it you know, right around when COVID started, and they're now getting back into that pattern of looking for a 2% increase. And last but not least, our- and, just, I'm sorry, and when you say a 2% increase, that comes from the taxpayers, not from the school district, correct? Right. We. It's just that the proposition is voted on during the budget. Correct. Budget so process. they don't have to incur the cost of, of a vote. Right. Okay. Correct. We're a vehicle. Yeah. We're just a vehicle for their collection. Exactly. If they weren't asking for an increase, you wouldn't see a proposition. They only need a proposition if they're, if they're asking for something. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, Board of Education candidates, we have three seats open this year. And so if anybody is interested in running for a seat on the Board of Education, you just need to reach out to the district clerk and we'll send you a petition. If, uh, I, I did ask one of our board members, so uh, uh, her name will name, her name, remain anonymous, but if anybody did want to talk to a Board of Education member about their experience so that you can learn more before making a decision, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you. So uh, a lot of numbers here. I'm not going to I'm not going to bore you with what's here. I only need you to know two things, uh, and all the numbers are here. One, everything that you see is prescribed, except for one area. And so this is a calculation that we do. Numbers come from various sources. There's no uh, control over those figures. We have no control whatsoever. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all the great details here. I just wanted to point out the one area that we do have some flexibility, and it's in the lower right-hand corner. So I just highlighted this uh, area where we do have some flexibility, and you'll see the, the number of $200,000. What that represents is our, our allocation for capital outlay projects. Those are small, minor capital improvement projects that we identify you know, at various times, it could be a simple lighting replacement project, it could be security cameras, door replacement. Uh, there are a variety of things that you might imagine a school needs to do to maintain its facilities. So rather than having this, you know, massive vote to, to approve a door replacement project, we've built in a, a pool of dollars, in this case, $200,000 to do that work. The reason that I'm pointing it out this year is that last year, we actually reduce this number from 200,000 to 100,000. The reason we do that is that we're trying to maintain a stable tax levy increase each year of around 2%. And so if we were to not affect this number this year, our tax levy limit uh, with this number in is 1.89%. If we were to not increase this from 100 to 200,000, our tax levy limit would be roughly 1.4 percent. Okay, so it's so by adding this hundred thousand dollars, it's increasing our levy limit by about a half a percent, or precisely hundred thousand uh, dollars. So 
we, we will say this every year that we're trying to maintain a levy limit or, or a levy increase of roughly 2%. The reason we reduced it last year was because our levy limit had exceeded 2%. So we said, well, we're going to have to now pull back this area of our budget and bring our levy limit down to 2%. So, uh, so in some years, we're going to reduce it. In some years, we're going to increase it. This, this is like started with this slide. This is the one area that we have some control over with the tax levy limit. And so we are uh, using that control this year to increase that area of the budget from $100,000 to $200,000. So the other thing I want to point out is that it's critical that we maintain this line in the budget because otherwise, the capital improvements that you're doing that you need to do, this is sort of in the repair, almost the repair category, because it's not enough money to do anything major. I know it seems like a lot of money, but you know, it, even a, replacing a door set costs a fortune. So by keeping this money in here, we're able to do the repairs and drive building aid. If you don't, if you don't do your repairs in a certain way, you're literally spending straight out cash with no building aid, which is not a fiscally wise way to do things. And if we draw this money down and don't put anything there at all, the other alternative is we don't have money to do the repairs and things fall into disrepair. And then you see volatility in your larger projects because all of a sudden you've got an emergency, you know, because there's so many things that need to be repaired. Then you have to go out uh, for this very large project and create a lot of volatility on the other side. So all of our approaches are to take the most measured, fiscally responsible way to maintain the facilities. In addition to the fact that we are trying to not create spikes in the levy because that's volatile as well for people. I'm sorry, did you say that that, um, that line is aidable? Yes. Tony, what is the door? Is just an example, or is that something that you have targeted with that? Like, what more things are, are you playing? Uh, great question. Uh, so we actually are looking at hardening some of our exterior doors. There is, there are, there's building aid, which uh, those would be able. There also, there's also some additional grant money coming forth for uh, hardening secure entrances. Um, so I'll give you an example of what we have used this morning for uh, the, the bleachers and the gymnasium. If you remember the wooden ones that were there roughly four years ago? Splintering. Uh, splintering. Uh, so we were able to use these dollars to replace, replace those bleachers, natural token. Uh, we did some concrete work. Stairs uh, from the lower parking lot of DMS was that out of this line? Correct. Yep. So they, there was uh, concrete walkways and some paving that occurred around the west side of DMS. Um, and like I mentioned, the stairs leading up to the bleacher. In my opinion, quite treacherous previously. So, uh, it's the funds for that. Uh, we, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, we're replacing, uh, actually enhancing the sound system in the DMS auditorium. And in all likelihood, we'll be replacing the auditorium seating at DMS within the next year, year or two. So, these dollars that are here that you're seeing on the screen, in all likelihood, will be used for auditorium. So um, just to just to uh, bring this to closure, the so the tax levy limit is one point eight nine percent. That is the final uh, calculation. All the variables that go into this this uh, calculation have we have uh, have been received and they're reflected here. You can, if you look down in that beige colored box, it shows the maximum dollar increase with simple majority. So meaning. We only need a simple majority because we're not exceeding the property tax levy cap. And that's what 1.89% generates in revenue. That number differs dramatically by district. You're, you will have districts that are going out for a 1.89% tax levy increase that, are, that will be able to collect $87,000. And you'll have ones that'll be collecting $1.2 million. Remember, it, it's all based on a percentage of your levy, and everybody's levy is different. So the one percent of the levy is different. So taking a peek, I'm sorry. Uh, before we get into where we stand with the budget currently, 
Uh, we did want to draw attention to something our music teachers have been working on. So this is the one I'm going to share with you is very, very common that music teachers will come to the business administrator or the superintendent and say, we really need three euphoniums. We need a man because we have you know kids that have come into the program, they want to play the euphonium. Well, the euphonium runs around five to six thousand dollars. And so typically when that happens, it's a surprise. Typically, and surely coincidentally, after the budget has been adopted, somebody's coming to look for, for some money that wasn't planned for. And so we go throughout the budget, we scrape here, we scrape there, and we figure out how to get them these music instruments. That's not the ide ideal way to handle purchasing music instruments. So our music teachers um, took an inventory of their existing instruments and also took a look at uh, student needs and identified a list of uh, 39 instruments that would either need to be replaced at some point in the future or purchased new. And then I asked them to identify approximately what year would they need to purchase those instruments. And so they're, they're actually still massaging that, but we know that they'll need roughly $30,000 a year uh, to have available to them. And I want to be clear, the way our entire budget works, we might budget 30,000 for something, but if we only need to spend 10, we only spend 10. And our music teachers are very uh, conservative. They, they do a great job, as we say here, maintaining their instruments by either cleaning or repairing them. But every once in a while, an instrument does need to be replaced. And so all we're trying to do is be responsible, budget the dollars, and so they don't we don't have to, as they say, scrape various areas of the budget to make make these purchases. Um, so so they've really done a nice job. They're, we're only talking about the major music instruments. So we're not talking about the you know the small little xylophones or recorders or anything like that. These are instruments that I, I think I might have indicated here are from four hundred thirty dollars. Uh, for a, a xylophone on a stand to eighty one hundred dollars for a tuba, and this is K through twelve. This is K through twelve, correct? All three bands. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, I got to hand it to them. They are very. Uh, they're a frugal group, which for a business administrator is great news, uh, because we don't have to figure out what they really need. They're, they're these are not fine the sky people. Uh, they're only identifying what they what they truly need. So many components. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a lot, there's a lot of points. Now, and actually the ones that I think you're seeing there uh, are the uh, more beginner euphoniums. Uh, they also have, Michelle had, uh, had pointed out in our initial discussions uh, that they used to rent music instruments, instruments in Moravia. So the more expensive euphoniums, they actually secured a, the cost to rent a euphonium. I think it was $360 per year per euphonium. And so that's actually the more um, economical approach is to rent those rent those euphoniums. Tony, on your location for some of those euphoniums, what is home by? <laughs> I apologize. This is a much bigger spreadsheet. <laughs> I just wanted to give you a visual in the slide. Uh, I can bring up the actual sheet. It's pro probably not much value doing that. What, so what I said to them is uh, determine whether you're going to want to buy or you're going to want to rent. And then put the cost in to either buy or rent. So when they choose that drop down, it'll change the scheduling. And the, this this actually goes out for 15 years. Uh, this this uh, for different plan. What's that? <laughs> oh, yeah, my turn. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, my turn too. <laughs> yeah, this is I know a, it's, it's a lot of a lot, yeah, lot more to it than what you're seeing. Senior high school is just here's the whole so uh, yeah, trust me, they've done a nice job. Uh, I didn't think there was a need to bring up the entire schedule. But, no. Uh, I just wanted you to know that they, they did put a good amount of effort into it. And I believe this is the last slide for budget. Uh, so just giving you a picture of where we were at the very top back on January 25th. Uh, these are the various things that have happened throughout the course of time since January. Uh, so we have some variables that that reduction of 168,000 that's either a change in retirement contribution rates from what was projected to what's uh, hasn't yet been but it will be adopted uh, the uh, health insurance premium increases OCs so these are variables that all work themselves out from the beginning of the budget process to the end and those variables are 
resulting in a reduction in expenditures of 168,687. The next line is that $100,000 we talked about earlier. The 125,967, that is the uh, end result of the final tax cap calculation. 100,000 is the capital money. The other 25,967 is from a variety of things that happen. Ultimately, capital exclusions. There's a, uh, there's a allowable there's a tax based growth factor and an allowable levy limit increase, uh, in addition to some capital exclusions. So a lot of a lot of details in there uh, that resulted in the tax levy limit uh, being adjusted by one twenty five nine sixty seven. Uh, foundation aid. So this, when the executive budget was released, if you remember, I think Mike or Janine, somebody had asked me, is the governor's budget reflected in our initial budget projections? The answer is no. 281,197 is the additional aid that we'll realize from the governor's uh, budget. And, uh, you know, that's that's the governor's uh, legislature won't adopt until around April 1st. So we'll see what that, that number is. Pretty historically, that number is the floor. Um, I don't know that we'll see much difference in it. it. There used to be quite a bit of difference realized, but there's been less of a difference realized, but it generally is the floor, not the ceiling. I'm hoping that the difference is $91,247. <laughs> 62 cents. <laughs> the uh, 26,000 is the dollars for the music instruments uh, replacement schedule. Uh, Ryan Riefler actually uh, reached out to me and said, hey, can you increase our custodial supply budget by 10% to align with consumer price index? That was very uh, wise of Ryan to make that request. And I said, you know, uh, that's probably appropriate for our entire supply budget. And so that's simply taking 10% of our supplies budget um, and adding 10% of our supplies budget here. Um, you know, I don't have any magical way to calculate that number. So using an approximate increase you know, is the best we can do. Um, John had identified uh, when we have a retirement this year, our, our, uh, uh, our high school uh, social studies program, uh, we had the uh, individuals retiring. And so John had determined that it's not necessary to fill that position. However, uh, we do need to add a 1.0 FTE elementary position uh, due to uh, enrollment. So in the end, uh, total expenditures, total revenues, the current budget gap is $91,247, which as I said, would be great if their exactly legislature would just legislature. add that amount to. Exactly what the legislature will give us. Tony, when you're looking at the retirement and then the addition of that, doesn't it seem like there should be a disparity between somebody at the end of their career and then what we hire? Great question. <laughs> now, let me explain to you why. Um, so we we knew when you saw the first draft of the budget on January 25th that Mr. Hunter was retiring. So his salary and benefits came out of the budget. What I put in the, in the budget at that time was a, a, a new hire salary and you know assumptions for benefits. We never put in brand new. We put some experience in just because you don't know where you're So that out. reduction of 1.0 FTE source is just really not a place for accurate not of the, the person retiring, correct? Correct. And I should be clear that that's salary and benefits. So the benefits are running around $40,000. We are now between health insurance, Social Security, Medicare, and retirement. So new, new teachers starting at, we'll say, roughly 63000 in salary, and then add benefits on top of that. So yeah, we're currently sitting at a budget gap of 91,247. So uh, I, I think Michelle might have only conveyed to Mike about the board possibly, is that correct? The board possibly adopting on March 20th. No. So, so it's what I would like the board to consider doing is adopting the budget on March 28th. We know we're gonna get some additional aid. That is a, that's also a budget number. It, it's gonna swing up or down a little bit. Um, so my suggestion is uh, to, to consider adopting the budget on March 28th because of the timeline for preparing mail materials in the post office processing. 
with our capital project vote, we sent out the uh, mailing information two weeks prior to the hearing. And some folks did not get it until after the date. Uh, nothing we can do. But I don't, I'm not, I have no explanation as to what's going on with the post office. They're just delayed. And so this will give us time to get materials printed. We actually can't send it to the printer until April 19th because we have to wait until then to, for board candidates and their bio information. But we'd like to be ready to go to the printer first thing uh, uh, the morning of April 19th. And uh, it's, as Michelle started off with, it's a pretty uneventful budget. And I don't see our the expense side of our budget changing. Uh, all the variables that are out there have already held in finance. And that's really what you're adopting is an, an, expen an expenditure plan of doing that exceed, so. But we just have to understand as a board that we would be adopting a budget prior to the state adopting their budget. Yep, there will very likely be an on-time state budget. They, that was a thing of the past, you know, that the budget would be approved, you know, sometimes a month after it was supposed to be, sometimes after communities had already approved their budget, uh, the state budget would come in. But uh, when Governor Cuomo came in, that was one of his campaign, his campaign stances is that there would be on-time budgets. And it, it's held true pretty much every year, April 1st, we'll have a budget. Uh, like I said, there's so much history around how these things work that we feel every confidence that um, we're not in a position where it will create an issue. So if we were to uh, present the budget to you on March 28th, it would be this uh, figure here of 38.97. Uh, that's uh, it's actually, I mean, uh, throwing a, a dart here, but I believe it's around one and a half percent budget increase. Budget increase year over year. Yep, and the levy increase would be 1.89. Uh, if there are no other questions, yeah. uh, thank you. I know that was a little long-winded, uh, but that's, that was our budget process, essentially. Do you have anything for No, I don't believe so. Any, any other questions? Building project update. So as you all know, we're capturing the last bit of the project that, in, that really included the turf work that was the turf and track were the big pieces of the last project that we're wrapping up. And the other piece that we were able to, to capture was an alternate, and that was a much needed overhaul of the KCH kitchen. And I wanted to share some images with you. I'll also um, use these images in a video to post to the community so that they can see. But the timing of the kitchen work, I think, has created probably a little bit of frustration for parents of KCH students and maybe some of the staff there, but we're, we're trying to deal with supply chain issues and also make sure that we stay in the, the proper fiscal window uh, with escalation happening with pretty much everything. I mean, we're all seeing it. Um, we needed to make sure that we stayed on track. We had people secured to do the work. And the minute we were able to secure the materials to do the work, we needed to start the work. So we had a plan to close the kitchen, you know, during the school year, deliver lunch to kids. The plan is working and the kitchen work is progressing. So the first thing that needed to happen was pretty much a gut of the space. Uh, they, they removed all the equipment. Um, I know that our staff, you know, Ryan and his crew and Donna Rice, I think everybody pitched in to make sure that things were removed and things that we were preserving were put in a place they could be preserved. So this is sort of what the space looked like gutted with everything out and the ceilings removed. So you can, here's just some other, I tried to take angles from around. It's not a very large space. I don't know how many of you've really been hanging out in the KCH kitchen, um, but it looked really quite large when it was gutted and it's starting to look small again as soon as they start to do the put back. So this is more, this is, um, this area back here where the door is open is actually the back of the building, that back door. And this area is up by the serving line where you see this um, black plastic covering. 
that's the fun of the cafeteria where kids would go in and get their food just to orient you a little bit. Um, this is actually post gut of the space. They started doing rough in, so they call it, you know, MEP rough in mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. They start putting in the new ductwork in the ceiling. And you can't see a lot on the, actually, this is, I didn't take any great shots of any of the um, rough in on the floor, but you can see some of the pipes sticking up here in this floor area. Those are all rough ends where they'll do tie-ins for electrical and plumbing. And this is actually the new floor. They started putting the floor down. So I went over and got some pictures today so that you can see the very latest. Um, that looks like the walls here are scarified uh, for new tile. It's a process that they use. There's different ways that you can do it, but it prepares the wall tile to accept tile over tile. And then of course the, the floors were prepped uh, to accept the new floor tile. And these are just some other angles. This is a grease trap going in. And so this is just a little summary. Kitchen demo was completed. The MEP roughens completed. Floors and walls prepped for accepting tile. And the floor tile, I would say, is I'm going to say 50% done because obviously it has to be grouted and whatnot too. But a large portion of the tile itself is already down. So things are going well uh, and running smoothly. Everybody seems content down there now that we've made the switch over with meal delivery. I don't know if anybody has any questions about how that's progressing. Okay. All right. Item five, resident comments. Public expression at Board of Education meetings is encouraged and specific portion of the agenda shall provide for this privilege. In most instances, the board shall reserve judgment regarding questions and concerns that are brought to the board's attention at a Board of Education meeting as it is typically not prudent for the board to make instantaneous determinations. In addition, many issues that are brought to the board's attention do not require a formal determination by the board, but rather are most appropriately addressed by the superintendent of schools or persons designated by the superintendent with, without further board action. This is in accordance with Board of Education Policy 3220. At this time, are there any resident comments? Are there any Online. No resident comments. Item six business 6.1 adoption of the Marcellus 2022 2023 school year calendar. Resolved that the Board of Education approves the Marcellus Central School District. 2022-2023 school year calendar. May I have a motion? Yes. Janine? And second. Mike, second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. 6.2 propositions for the 2022 annual district meeting. Resolved that the Board of Education approves the attached resolution establishing the propositions to appear on the ballot at the 2022 annual district meeting and election. May I have a motion? Motion. Sean? Second? Second. Kelly? Questions? I will take a roll call vote. When I say your name, please state that you are present and how you are voting, yay or nay. Michael McAuliffe, present, yay. Christine Shea? Michael Bristol. Present, yes. Sean Eddy. Present, yes. <clears throat> yes. Janine Lundergan. Present, yes. Kelly Rossiter. Present, yes. Patty Sager. Item 6.3, authorization to enter into agreement for construction management services. Resolved that the Board of Education authorizes the superintendent to enter into an agreement with CNS companies for construction management services. May I have a motion? Yes. Janine. In the second. Mike, second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And carried. Item 6.4, gift donation to the district. 
resolved that the Board of Education approves the $2,300 donation by the New York State FFA to the Marcellus Agriculture and CTE program. I have a motion. Motion. Kelly. Second. Sean. Questions or comments? Excited to take another uh, was step this, forward. Was, so this was a, a is this a grant or another a grant? Yeah. Okay. Joe and Caitlin have gone after, so they're doing a great job. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Item 6.5, authorization to enter into agreement for architectural services. I think everybody can read all the yeah. whereas, <laughs> right? Yes, I'll make right. a motion, Mike. May I have a motion, uh, Janine? Second, Mike. Questions or comments about the whereas? <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And carry. Item seven, personnel. Resolve that the following personnel items be approved. Item 7.1 through 7.9. May I have a motion? Motion. Sean? Second? Second. Kelly? Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And carry. Item eight, consent agenda. Resolved that the consent agenda consisting of the following items be approved. Items 8.1 through 8.8. .8. May I have a motion? motion. Sean. Second. Mike, second. Questions or comments? Uh, I'd like to make one quick comment. The student government um, collection of supplies for Ukraine, this is a fundraiser that just due to the timeliness of the situation in the Ukraine, and what local organizations are accepting and not accepting. There's a lot of flux. And uh, Chrissy actually is here tonight. Chrissy Willis is the head of our student government. She's the faculty advisor. She said, I don't know that we're going to be able to actually do that fundraiser specifically as it's written. So they are going to continue with the fundraiser. It's the strong desire of the students to help out and do something. Um, she is still seeking an organization and what their needs are, but it may be some sort of a penny drive or a monetary collection. A lot of organizations do not want any more supply type things because they're inundated and have a hard time finding ways to ship them to the area. So uh, if you feel uncomfortable accepting that as modified, that it's in flux a little bit, um, I, we can certainly put it on at a later date. I, the problem is it will really kick the can down the road. And this was just evolving today. So there's really no way to give you any additional notice. I'm comfortable with leaving it as is, supplies is generic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you for this. I appreciate it. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Item nine, information items. Just really quickly, next board meeting, you're going to be voting on a new Spanish textbook called Imagina. And I have it here. It's all in Spanish. And I know you'll want to probably read through it tonight before you leave. <laughs> I thought about reading some pages to you, but. If you would like to take a glance at it, you're welcome to. De nada. Muy bien. No hay ningún problema. Oh, I got it. the wrong conversation. <laughs> um, all right. Item 10, uh, resident comments. Any resident comments at this time? <clears throat> Item 11, executive session. Uh, there is no ex executive session this evening. Therefore, we are moving on to adjournment. Resolved that the Board of Education Meeting be adjourned. I have a motion. Yes. Me. Second. Mike second. Time is 7.59. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carry. Thank you for coming out tonight to this evening Board of Education meeting. If there are any students that need to have anything signed, we'd be happy to. Thank you. <laughs>